Welcome to another RDWorks Learning Lab. Now today we're working on this machine. Now this is my Tangerine Tiger and for those people that are not familiar with the Tangerine Tiger series that I produced. This is a cheap Chinese machine that I bought and modified and added an RF laser source to it to try and explore exactly what the magic is in RF technology. And I've been to several exhibitions where glass tubes have been, let me be kind and say rubbished by the big boys. Glass tube power stability is terrible. They only last a year. You know, basically the machines are cheap and nasty. Everything about the technology is useless. So why spend $1,500 to $2,000 on a machine like this when you can buy one of our machines for $20,000 and get good results? Once I built this machine, I spent probably another year testing it to try and find out what this magic was in the technology. I never found it. Smoke and mirrors, I think, is the best thing that I can describe it as by the marketing people. Now, it's probably at least four years ago with my glass tube machines that I found out how to do proper photo replication. And it all depends on the size and quality of the little dot that you can produce to replicate a pixel. During the year that I was busy playing with, with this machine, I tried my hardest to get decent photo replication out of this machine because it has the capability of going very fast but it's only 30 watts and I found the limitation was actually the 30 watts plus the fact that it couldn't do anything like half decent photo replication. Now I've been using this machine as a bit of an experimental test bed to try and evaluate what happens when you can keep a very very small high intensity beam projected right across to the work area because it comes out of the tube very very small and very intense and with normal RF machines the beam divergence represents a big problem. Now beam divergence is defined as, if you like, the size at which the beam grows as it moves further away from the source. And with an RF source, typically that growth is roughly eight millimeters per meter. Now that's a huge amount of beam change. And that means that over in the back corner of the machine, it might cut well. And in the front corner of the machine, it will cut like a blunt knife. And then theory says that when you expand the beam, you can also control the parallelism of the beam. So what they do is they change the beam to 12 millimeters at the back and 12 millimeters at the front. So it's a blunt knife at the back and a blunt knife at the front. Now a blunt knife is great for engraving, but it's not very good for cutting. So in essence, these machines are generally engraving machines that will cut, but not very efficiently. And I think that fact is evidenced by a recent document that I saw from Trotec, who have now, after years of rubbishing glass tubes, have decided that, yeah, they're pretty good for cutting and we're gonna add one to our machine. If you go and look at some of the new Trotec documents, you'll find that they have included glass tube technology in their machines. They're late to the party, but they got there eventually. Now, using the experience that I gained on my fiber laser machine, I found a way to do photo replication on this machine, as you saw in the last session. Now, amazing as this picture is, I look at it and I'm very critical. Because first of all, if we look here, you'll see that there's a couple of bands that are running through this picture. And down here, if you look carefully, you can see that there is some sort of very slight banding effect that's happening down here. Now, Okay, it doesn't detract from the basic idea that yes, I've solved the essential problem of working out how to do photo replication on this RF machine after I failed over a period of a couple of months when I tried it a year and a half ago. Many people have told me that this is all to do with thermal effects, heating, and I'm getting problems with my laser tube. I've never had problems with my laser tubes, my glass tubes before, and supposedly RF tubes are more stable than glass tubes. That isn't what the specification actually says. They're both plus or minus 5% power stability. I believe that we've got a problem here with something called aliasing, where the frequency is not matching the pixels that are in the picture. I could change the PWM, PWM frequency and get rid of these, what appear to be aliasing patterns in the x-axis, and now we've got these aliasing patterns appearing in the y-axis. That's the purpose of today's session. Well, here we are at my PC 
in the cool of the office and yeah I'm going to continue in here because we need to use the computer to explain graphics. I'm going to venture onto very thin ice later on plus somewhere I've never been before to try and investigate what's going on but before I do that I've really got to bring you up to speed on what graphics is all about. The new technology that's out there Lightburn for example and things like ImageR which allow you to modify your picture so that it can be lacered and I can't ever speak too highly about Lightburn it's got an amazing set of graphics tools that allow you to be an expert at graphics without knowing what you're doing and certainly you don't need to understand your machine to be able to create reasonable pictures that your friends will say wow in real terms, most people these days do not need an understanding of digital graphics to become a digital god. Because you can produce reasonable results, you're never going to explore what digital graphics are all about. When I first started off, Lightburn was not around. I spent ages producing digital barbecued pieces of wood. And it was from that pile of ashes that I had to try and understand what was going wrong. What was I doing to create such wonderful pieces of rubbish? All right, so I had to go right back to basics and with the aid of one or two people in the graphics industry who taught me some very interesting points, I gradually began to understand the relationship between my machine, which basically we're trying to use as a printing machine, and the digital graphics that we see on the screen here. Now, you will all be familiar with the early brown sepia looking photographs and even photographs up to the late 1900s were all what I would call analogue photographs. The changes of colour from black to white in a photograph were all completely seamless. They just merged into each other and morphed from black to white through shades of grey. And it wasn't until the invention of digital photographies, as computers became more and more common, that we get to today's type of pictures. In between times, there was this point at the beginning of the 1900s when newspapers wanted to put photographs in their newspapers. But hang on, we've only got black ink and white paper to work with. We'll come back to that point in a minute because with today's modern technology, I mean, this great picture that you see on the screen here with colour in it is made up of things called pixels. They're little teeny weeny increments of colour. Let me just zoom into this and I'll show you what I mean. As we get in really close, what you can see is there are all these little squares. There's small squares inside those squares because of the, the resolution of this screen. But the image that I'm trying to portray are these pixels that you can see on the screen here very obviously. Now each one of these pixels has got a different colour okay and when you put these colours beside each other as we zoom away you can't see the pixels all you see is the picture because the pixels are far smaller than your sight can resolve. You cannot see the smallness of the pixels in that picture. What you see is an average of those coloured pixels. So graphics is all about fooling the eye and I'm going to transfer it into something that I can print on my laser machine. Now I know because I've done experimentation and created lens systems that allow me to produce dots on my material which are 0.1 diameter. So what I've done, I've set this image up here so that it's got 0.1 square pixels in the image. I'm not going to tell you what I'm doing. I'm just going to show you that I'm going to size that picture to fit in the A4 frame. And I've set the resolution of that picture to 254 pixels per inch, which means each pixel is 0.1 of a millimeter square. I think previously we had 300 pixels per inch in the image and this is now 254. So we've downscaled the picture, which is a very important part when you're playing with graphics. Try not to upscale a picture, always try to downscale it. I know that I can put 0.1 dots down 
to simulate each one of the pixels on that screen. The problem is, my laser machine doesn't print colour. It burns. Now, depending on the material that I put underneath the laser beam depends on the colour that I'm going to burn. But in essence, what I'm trying to do is to simulate a black and white printing machine. White paper, black ink. That's all we've got to work with. Let's change this to grayscale. And there we go, it's the same image, but this time what I've done, I've removed all the color and I've simplified the picture to just shades of gray. There's 254 shades in that picture between black and white, which are the extremes. So there's 256 total, but 256 different shades of grey between the extremes. And there's the same image again. Look, we've got greys, we've got blacks. So every one of these little pixels here has got its own colour. And this is a bitmap. In other words, we've got everything about this picture the computer knows and understands because it's mapped in the background digitally. We see it on the screen as an image but there's a digital map in the background that defines the position of each one of these pixels and its colour. But again, we can't print grey. We can only print black. There are techniques that you can use on your machine with certain materials that allow you to sort of simulate grayscale. I don't want to get into that because that's far too confusing. We're just going to stay with the black and white print concept. If I can't print grey, how do I modify this picture to make it into black and white? Watch me do it now. I'm going to go into image, mode, bitmap, and I'm going to say flatten the layers. I'm going to do something here called a diffusion dither. <gasps> oh, I've destroyed the picture. Well, it just so happens that I haven't destroyed the picture because that resolution that you see here does, on, this, on this screen does not match the resolution of the picture. So let me just shrink the picture by one. And there we go. We've recovered our grayscale picture. This is basically the problem that we're beginning to see on my images. That was something called aliasing, where the dots on the screen did not match the dots in the image. Let's have a look at this and zoom in a little bit closer. What do we see? Can you see any grey in there? Well, you can't, because there is no grey in there. What I've done, I've turned it into black ink on white paper. But that's magic, because, look, it's the same grey scale image that we saw originally. You see, we've come round full circle. I've now fooled your eye into believing that's a grey scale image, because you cannot see the black dots on the white paper. Your eye is actually mixing the density of the black dots and the white paper to create shades of grey in your brain. And that's the trick that all digital graphics rely on. Your eye is integrating the density pattern of those dots to produce shades of grey. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the image that we're going to send down to Lightburn or RD Works or wherever is basically going to be something called a bitmap. It's a grid on which all the black pixels and the white pixels are defined. So relative to a corner zero, zero, every single square in this bitmap has got a dimension. When you send your picture down to the controller to be printed, it does a scan line across here. It's just switching the laser tube on and off according to what it sees in the Y pattern, the Y scan line. You can produce wonderful pictures on the screen, but if your picture on the screen is like that, but your dots that you're able to produce are that size, then look what's going to happen. Basically, what you're going to do is to change the ratio of black to white in your image. You're putting great big black dots down instead of small black dots. 
So you're masking some of the white and your picture will look, as I said, like my early pictures, barbecued wood. So it is important, vitally important, that you understand what your machine is capable of doing. If it's only capable of putting big dots down, then you can't work with high resolution pictures. You've got to make the resolution of your picture match the size of your machine's capability. Very few people realize that. And so consequently, what they do is this. And let me go back to the screen and I'll show you what you really do when you prepare your pictures for lasering. We've got our two images on the screen here. This one is actually a bitmap and this one is grayscale because you cannot fiddle with a bitmap once you've changed it to a bitmap. While it's in grayscale, you can do all sorts of wonderful things to it. Okay, so we've burnt great big blobs on our piece of wood. Basically, it means that we've got too much black and not enough white in our picture, so it's dark. There are two ways that you think about lightening a picture. One of them is to reduce the power. That's not gonna change the size of your dots. So forget about changing the power. The only way that you can do it is to change the ratio of black and white to, again, fool your eye into this false situation where it thinks it's seeing a nice quality picture. But let's just see what happens. If we want to make our image lighter, in other words, we want more white in our image because it's too dark, what we've got to do is we've got to make this image whiter to start with. So let's do that with our one or two tools that we've got. I can move these sliders around because these were black pieces to start with. They were seriously overburnt. So if I make those lighter, it will mean that they don't burn as deeply. Brightness and contrast. There we go. There's another favorite tool which people will use. They say, right, we want to make this a lot brighter. Wow, look at that. Contrast, well, we need to bring the contrast up a little bit. Oh no, that doesn't work, does it? Look, so we fiddle around with all these wonderful controls. We make it lighter. We've lost some of our definition, which we could get back with contrast or, and we've got something called unsharp mask. Well, hang on, that's a bit strange, weird. You don't want to unsharpen it, you want to sharpen it. But hey, we have to use unsharp mask. It's a very subtle tool and look, without changing the color, it's still a very light image. What we can do, we can enhance the outlines of certain things like the eyes. It's grayscale at the moment. We're going to change it and dither it. And we'll do this diffusion dither again. Okay, doesn't look any different. That's as far as I can zoom that one. Let's go on to this one. You can see the pixels are exactly the same size, but look at the number of pixels. This one has got a lot less black pixels in it. So it should be a lot lighter picture, but it's not going to be a lighter picture because you're not producing pixels that are this size. You're producing pixels that are two or three times this size. So what you're doing, you're actually masking out the white in this picture by putting bigger pixels down. And you're trying to get back to the same overall balance of white and black that you are in that image. Doesn't work because Look what you've done. You've sacrificed quality. I, it's very difficult for me to show you exactly what's going to happen when you put this onto a piece of wood now. It will be okay, but it certainly won't be photo replication. It will be photo engraving of an image that's been grossly distorted to try and make it look as close to the original as possible. Now that's the difference between photo replication and photo engraving. Photo replication, one dot equals one pixel. Here, well, one pixel still exists on this screen, but you're going to make one pixel into maybe two or three dots size. So you don't need any knowledge of your laser machine. You just put dots down, whatever they are and you adjust your picture so that you get approximately as close as you can back to the correct ratio of black to white in your image. And that's why you'll hear me only using the word photo replication. 
I do not subscribe to this principle of messing around with the image to make it good. We come back to the fundamental problem that we're trying to trace down, which is banding. We're going to get pixel information, which is not correct. If we assume that the scan is going this way, we wouldn't expect to find banding in this direction. But it's weird that, that aliasing in this direction can also cause aliasing in this direction. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to move into an area where I know a little bit about what we're going to talk about to start with, but we're gradually going to creep onto thin ice where I've never been before. Maybe I'll fall through, but hopefully what I'm trying to find is the link between what I've found on the RF machine and those people that are suffering problems with their glass tube machines. Right, just need to lubricate my two grey cells. We're sending a bitmap down to the controller and the controller knows where every single pixel is in your image. So when you start doing your scan, the controller knows where that pixel is. And when it recognizes the dimension, the coordinates for that pixel, it says, ah, there's a pixel there. Turn the laser tube on. And it looks across that pixel. And when it gets to the other side of that pixel, it says, nah, there's nothing there now, white, turn off. And that's a very important factor to remember about the way the laser works. If it sees black, it will turn on. And if it sees white, 255, remember that magic number, it will turn off. When it's a glass tube machine, this is the way the controller deals with the problem. It says, right, okay, turn on, turn off, turn on. I know we've got pixels there, but they're all in a string, so leave it on. Turn it off, on, off, on, off. And then we get to here, and we've got two single pixels, so it's going to do on, off, on, off. Okay, so that's the way in which the controller is reading these signal strings and sending information to turn the laser tube on and off. That mechanism is the same for both an RF machine and a glass tube machine. There is a fundamental problem when we come to printing a pixel. Let's take a look at these here, these two individual pixels here, which are one pixel apart. Now I'm going to draw these large scales so that you can see what I'm doing. So there are the pixels. And here comes the laser machine. The laser beam comes along. The signal says, turn on. As soon as it gets to the edge of that pixel, it says turn on. So there we go. We've got our laser beam turned on. It's scanning across the pixel. It knows exactly how far it's got to send the head because remember the, the controller is also controlling the distance of the head away from zero. So it knows exactly where the edges of the pixels are. And when it gets to the other side of the pixel, it will say, okay, turn off. Then it jumps across this gap here, one pixel, and it says, turn on. And it turns on once it reaches that point. But of course, at that point there, we've got a beam, which is that diameter. It scans across the pixel, and then it turns off at that point. And of course, again. Now, you can see what we've done there. We've masked one pixels with two pixel burn. So this is the size of the burn that we're going to get from our one pixel signal. And I think you can clearly see that's going to screw up the ratio of black and white in your image. So that's a fundamental problem that happens with like an RF machine or a diode machine, which is controlled by something called PWM. PWM is an instantaneous switch on capability which a glass tube machine does not have. When you switch the machine on, the first thing that has to happen is we, we raise the voltage to 25,000 volts, say, and we do that inside the HV power supply with something called a flyback transformer. Now, a flyback transformer does not instantly turn on. It takes a certain period of time to turn on. 
And during that turn on time, which for instance could be like that, there is no power. Okay, so only when the beam has become pink and we've got current flowing through the tube, do we get power output. So although we've told this beam to switch on at this point, we don't actually get power until maybe the middle of the pixel. And then it instantly switches off here and we might get half a beam hanging out the outside. We're going to get a delay here. So we switch on half a pixel late and we switch off. Yeah, we've still got two perfectly good pixels there. They just happen to be out by half a pixel. So we're not distorting our pixel string like we are here when we're using an RF machine which switches on instantly and switches off instantly. We're exploiting the response time problem which some would see as a problem in an in a glass tube machine to make sure that we get nice clean pixels and you do that by controlling the power. If you put too much power into photo engraving you will finish up with this situation. We've got to balance the properties of the HV power supply with very low power to get this effect, single pixels. And this is the reason why I've never been able to get successful photo replication on an RF machine. I've never been able to get it on a, on a fiber laser machine either until I discovered a wonderful feature in the fiber laser machine called drill mode. And drill mode basically means this. The fiber laser comes along and it says, ah, there's a pixel there. Stop. Then it moves along and it says, ah, we've got another pixel here. Sorry about the sound effects, but you know, I get carried away when I get excited. Um, so what it's doing with the fiber laser is exactly that. It's producing a burn for every pixel. And it produces wonderful images. Let's now look at how that has persuaded me that I could do something similar on this RF machine. Now both RF and diode machines are what I call funny animals. They work off of something called PWM. And it basically is a square wave signal that sits in the background and turns the laser on and off at a fixed rate. Not this rate. This signal from the controller here is recognizing when we've got pixels that need printing. This signal here, although it's regulated by the controller, it's not synchronized to these signals here. With an RF or a diode machine, the laser operates only at one single power, full power. There's nothing in between. You either turn it on or you turn it off. Unlike a glass tube machine, which has got variable power, this has no variable power. It's on or off. And the way that you regulate the power on these RF controlled machines is by doing this. So it's from there to there is a pulse. And we're getting 10,000 of those per second. In the same way that these signals here turn the laser on and off, these also turn the laser signal on and off. Your percent power on a PWM machine is not changing the power. What it's doing is changing this ratio here. So this happens to be 50% on and 50% off. So the principle very simply is if you expose 50 watts, the assumption is you're doing 25 watts worth of damage if you've got it switched on 50% of the time. And if you want less power, then you choose a different duty cycle. So you want say 10% power. So you turn it on 10% of the time and you turn it off for 90% of the time. And that is how you control the power on an RF or a diode laser with PWM. It's exposure time the amount of damage you can create in a certain time. 
not the, not the amount of damage you can produce with a certain amount of power. It's a subtle difference, but it makes a big difference to the performance of the machines themselves. Here's our pixel string. We've got a black pixel, white, white, black, black, white, and black. Okay, so here's what the controller will say to the laser tube. On, off, off, on, on, off, on. That's the signal that will be required to turn the laser tube off to print these pixels. And here we've got our matching 10 kilohertz signal. This is 10,000 dots per second, and this is 10,000 pulses per second. Here's the PWM signal up here, and it doesn't matter whether it's 50% power or 90% power. You know, all we're doing is we change the duty cycle. We don't change the frequency of the PWM, but there are actually many problems that could cause strange effects. When I've checked on the RF machine with my little oscilloscope, there is no relationship between this starting point and this signal. This signal is running freely in the background at 10 kilohertz. There's no synchronization between a pixel and a pulse. So let's just see what happens to this black pixel here. Now, it's gonna switch on at this point, and at this point we have power, look. So we shall get some power between there and there. And then it turns off for 10% of the time, and then it turns back on again. So that pixel is only receiving, what, 90%? Actually, it is receiving 90%, isn't it? Because it's losing 10%. And then this white pixel, well, it's off. So we ignore what's happening here and we're only interested in what's happening to black pixels. So the black pixel switches on here. It has 10% missing out the middle there. So that receives 90% as well. So it appears that the black pixels, even though they're out of sync with the signal, will still receive 90% of the available power. So that technically removes exposure time or power variation from the equation. And why is it that the controller appears to not be able to synchronize because I have to adjust the frequency to get things back into synchronization? Doesn't make sense. So I sat down and reasoned that the other area where things could go wrong was if the head was not doing what the controller said. The controller says, move point one, pulse, move point one, pulse, move point one, pulse. Is it moving by point one every time I ask it to move by point one? Well, that really comes back to a problem here at the stepper drive. The stepper driver has got a series of numbers on it. They're pulses. They're not pulses per second or anything like that. They're pulses per revolution of this stepper motor. It depends on the size of this gear that's on here as to how much this belt will move in one revolution. So we're dividing one revolution of this motor into 2,500 increments. I'm using 2,500 just as a a guess. It, I've got no idea what this machine is doing. When I ask the stepper motor to move by a certain amount, if that amount is not an equal increment of the 2,500 pulses, I'm not going to get the stepper motor moving at exactly the right amount. So I've gone into manual set, enter, and that allows me to define the distance that I can move the head when I press these buttons. I can either make it move continuously or I can go into this mode here called manual mode. And what I've done, I've, step, I've set the resolution here, the step resolution to 0.1 of a millimeter. So every time I press this button either way, the head will move by 0.1 of a millimeter. That's great because now that's my pixel in increment. And now I can find out what's happening every time I ask the stepper motor to move 0.1. Is it moving by 0.1 or is it moving some other distance which is causing, let's call it an aliasing pattern. The dot is not going down in the right place. 
And the whole point about a dithered pattern is it relies on the spacing or the density of the dots to create this impression of grey scale. So this banding may be nothing to do with temperature or intensity or the ability of the machine to put dots down. They're just being put in the wrong position. And if they're too close together, you will get the impression of a darker picture. If they're too far apart, it will create the impression of a lighter picture. Position of the dots in the image is very, very important. It must be accurate. Okay, let's take a quick look at what one millimeter looks like. 10 pulses. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. Come back nearly to the, the right position, so it's 0.015 out maybe. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. It's within 0.01. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay, so it's, it's reasonably accurate for a millimetre. What's it like for 0.1 of a millimetre, I wonder? So we're sitting there at 0.02. 0 0.02, 0 0.025, 25, 3, 25, 2, 25, 3, 5, 4, Four. Hmm, it's drifting. So, okay, we've set that to zero. Okay, we'll now move by point one. Zero, zero, five. Now, along, the, along this axis here, we've got zero error. And up here, we've got point zero, two, and point zero, four, and minus point zero, two. So, the errors don't appear to be huge. Uh, typically we're getting a change of plus or minus 0 0.02 which is about a thousandth of an inch but what we're getting is a drift over 10 millimeters as you can see so there's a gradual error that's coming in a cumulative error that's coming in as well as if you like I was expecting a pattern of maybe plus and minus and plus and minus so that we could see maybe an aliasing pattern but we definitely don't have that here unless it's over a much longer period than 10 millimeters well i think this is a dead end as well because look we've got a very small cyclic variation here which appears to be a pattern of sorts and we've got a very, very, very slow drift here over 10 millimetres of the order of about 0 0.02. Well, that means every 10 millimetres, we're going to get a 0 0.02 drift. That means I've got to go five of those, which is 50 millimetres, before I get a single pixel out of place. I, I really don't think that this is anything to worry about. So we've got to look elsewhere. If you remember back, I admitted to making a bit of a mistake when I set the PWM for one of my tests. Okay, instead of 7.7 .7 kilohertz, I set it to 1.7 kilohertz. Well, look, I'm going to simulate the same sort of thing here on this model by instead of using 10 kilohertz, we're going to use 1 kilohertz. And what that basically means is I'm going to get one tenth of the pulses, 90% high and 10% low which is my percent power setting that I'm using. Just because I've got this set to 90% power, it's 90% duration, not 90% power. The power is always 100%. Whereas here I was getting 30 watts half the time and zero for the other half. And here I was getting 30 watts for 90% of the time and then zero. Now I'm getting 30 watts all the time along here and then zero. So let's superimpose my original pixels back onto this picture. And of course we're running now at a slower frequency. On, because it's a black pixel. And so here we've got 100% power. So we shall have 30 watts just there. Then it's white, off, white, off. Even though this is on, 
it won't have any effect because the controller is saying don't don't switch on okay so then we switch on for a black pixel and we switch on for a black pixel but look we're still on so we should be on for 100 percent 100 percent 100 percent 100 percent 30 watts all the way across those two pixels off even though it's on on for a pixel but hang about have we got the beginning of a problem here because look the amount that's on only gets us as far as there so we've got a pixel here a black pixel which is only receiving 20 percent maybe of its exposure time and so that's going to produce a smaller dot Perhaps I ought to explain that because there's another rather strange peculiarity about an RF laser. OK, now this is a picture of a glass tube mode burn. Here we've got full power for 10 seconds. And you can see that we've got a lovely Gaussian distribution here where the power at the centre is doing the most damage. And after 10 seconds, this is what we produce. Now, when we change the power on a glass tube machine, we no longer get a sharp beam. This is 15% power. And look, the beam has now turned into a blunt beam. It's no longer this sharp beam. And that's one of the interesting peculiarities about a glass tube. You can change the shape of the beam from sharp to blunt by changing the power. The point that I'm making there is, if you take a look here approximately, you'll see that the diameter of this beam is not much different to the diameter of this beam here. So 15% power only makes the beam blunt. It doesn't change the beam diameter. Let's compare that with the beam that I'm actually using to do this test. This beam here is much smaller diameter than the glass tube machine. And as a consequence, its intensity is much, much higher and it was able to burn through this same 25 millimeter block in about four or five seconds, as opposed to 10 seconds. Right. So that's the influence of intensity on material damage speed. Now, this is 15 percent power. The shape of the beam never changes. Given a little bit more exposure time, 15 percent, 100%. If we change this 15% to say 10%, we would get this. 5%, we would get this. 2%, we'd get that. The beam shape does not change. What changes as you change the power? Look at the diameter of the damage. The dot size that we're producing on this machine is controllable by the exposure time. So if my dots are too big, I reduce the power. And in reducing the power, I can decrease the dot size. So there's a big difference between these two technologies. Now, the reason I showed you that picture is because, look, we've got full power on each one of these black pixels here for 100 microseconds. That's what this frequency, uh, that's what that frequency is creating. A hundred microseconds of exposure. A hundred microseconds of exposure, hundred microseconds of exposure. So therefore all these pixels will be the same diameter. This one has only got 20 microseconds of exposure. So go back to that picture that I've just shown you and we'll go towards the front end of that cone and the cone will get smaller. The dot will get smaller. So we're changing the ratio of black to white around that dot. It's no longer a full size dot. And if we get a pattern that develops, that will show up as our aliasing shading. So. What I'm going to do, I'm going to now create a rather special pattern to try and track this problem down. Now, if you look at that pattern for too long, you might think you've been taking drugs. That is a very, very demanding pattern. 
and I'd love to see how many laces that are out there could actually attempt this pattern. We've got 0.1 white, 0.1 black, and it's in a checker pattern. And what I plan to do to start with is to scan it in opposite directions. That means I've got to get my reverse scanning offset absolutely perfect to get this set return row to match up with the first row. Now, as you can see, I've done quite a few tests on there. You can see from a distance, look, there's an aliasing pattern on there, and there are patterns on this one as well. And I will, I'll investigate and explain those when we put them under the microscope. Well, to cut a long story short, this is only part of that checker pattern. I found that when I was running backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards, I was getting really confusing images. So what I did was to change the line pitch from point one to point three. As you can see, we've got lines that come from this direction and then that direction and then this direction. So I've still got my alternating lines, but they're spaced out. I'm missing two lines in between. This is at 10 kilohertz. Now, as I move around this pattern, you'll see something really strange. Look, I've got lovely dots, lovely dots, and something that goes weird. And then we've got lovely dots, a bit weird. Let's have a look elsewhere. And we find, look, we've got, we've got lots of these weird patches coming in. Right, at 10 kilohertz. There's more, look, here. Okay, so let's go to 9.8. And we've still got some problems here and here and here and here. Then 9.6, and we've got problems all over the place. There's a couple here, there's a couple here, but they're much smaller, inconsistent patterns. So we drop down to nine, and we're seeing much the same sort of thing. Look, doubles, doubles, doubles. That would give me quite a reasonable image without any aliasing patterns, even though there are problems in there. 10.2. Well, we're getting quite a few, what I would call sausage pixels. We're getting this strange pattern here, look, of several sausage pixels. Missing and sausage pixels here. Let's just have a look elsewhere, just to show you that this is not a, this is nothing special. So, so look, we've got some missing ones here and sausages here again, missing ones and sausage. But look, they're all in the middle of a beautiful pattern of crisp, clean dots. So, it would indicate that we're getting this 20 microsecond type of effect that I just showed you. It could be anything between one microsecond and 100 microseconds, which is the pulse width. That would jump straight to nine kilohertz. They don't look significantly different, those dots. And let's take a look at the patterns that we've got in there. Well, there's one or two that might be classed as low power or missing, but there's no significant pattern in there at nine kilohertz. That is really weird. Does that mean to say the PWM is not running at 10 kilohertz? Or is the speed not running at a thousand millimeters a second? One of those two things must be wrong because there's no synchronization at 10 kilohertz. We've got synchronization at about nine kilohertz. So having got those reasonable results, I thought, okay, now is the time to put this back to 0.1 pitch and see how good the checker pattern is. You can see from these dots here that my checker pattern is basically pitched correctly because that second lot dot is between the first pair of dots. And in general, if you look across here, you can see diagonal lines just as there would be in my checker pattern, but it's a mess. Okay, the pattern is too close together, but we've got stability. And then we get towards the end, we've got a mess. And that would tell me that I've got a slight amount of ringing vibration on the nozzle after it has stepped between the lines. 
Okay, so this is a fantastic pattern for telling me what the problems are with my machine. I then decided to remove the scanning reverse offset from the equation. Still running at a thousand millimeters a second, but what I'm doing now is using unisca unilateral X scan. In other words, scan, 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 rather than scan, 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 scan. Right? We've got a pretty amazing replication of my checker pattern. But as we scan across here, you can't see any major patterns developing. Let's have a look at 10 kilohertz. Well, this is 10 kilohertz. We've got lovely dots again, and they're great as far as the checker pattern is concerned. Look, they're superb. But what's all this crap here? Look, we've got some sort of problem in the Y direction, even though I'm changing the frequency in the X direction. We're getting an aliasing pattern of some sort there, which, if I move up very slowly, all of a sudden, we've got a repeat of it. I'm going to have to check this pattern now to see what happens when I change away from 10 kilohertz in very small increments. This is the 9 kilohertz pattern. And look, it's got major disruptions in X. They're running across here at an angle like that. Look. So this is these are actually missing pixels. So it's amazing how sensitive this machine is to having exactly the right frequency to match the pixels. Otherwise, we're going to produce these aliasing patterns. So this is an 11 kilohertz signal running at basically creating 10,000 dots a second. They should match, but they don't. 10 is rubbish, and nine, it might work, but it's not very good. Next time, I'm going to apply what I found here to the Fox picture again. 1200 millimeters a second on the white tile. Is that possible? Catch up with you next time. Bye for now.